him. And so we're glad to be in that place of worshiping him. I'll ask you to turn with me to John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. I know that you thought I was going to the book of Acts, but the choir sung that, the praise team sung it so well, they told me there was no reason for following them up. They, they sung that thing out, you know, power, follow us, you know. So, so I, had to, I had to choose a different set of verses to preach from because they preached that. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23, really the story of Pentecost is all throughout Scripture. So you can pick about any Scripture you want and preach Pentecost because it's all throughout Scripture. I'm going to ask, as always, that um, Brother Daniel will come up and read that Scripture from the, uh, from the ESV. And uh, the Bible has one of the most honored people were the readers. They were the readers of scripture. They would come up and read. Jesus was honored one time when he was asked to come and read. And when he did, he read a very powerful scripture and told them the year of Jubilee is here. In honor of tradition of the house, will you please stand for the reading of the word of God? John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23 reads as follows. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. God, we thank you for your word. Glory to God. Glory to God. <clears throat> this pastor had so well uh, illuminated earlier that the word Pentecost actually means 50. And so it is a reference to uh, the 50 days that occur between Easter and that happen up to the time of Pentecost. It also went along with the Feast of Weeks, which was the time for the harvest. And so they would celebrate during this time because the harvest was coming. Oh, you know how powerful that is that in advance they would begin celebration for the harvest that was going to come. So Pentecost was the time that you would celebrate for the harvest being made ready. But you didn't start when the harvest was there. You started long before it got there. Forty days, 40 days after Jesus had uh, died was the ascension, and he ascended up into heaven. He spent 40 days here on earth, but we don't have a lot of biblical context for what he did a lot of that time. We know that graves opened up. We know that people walked, and we know he visited the, uh, the two disciples on the road of Emmaus, we know some things went on, but 40 days? I need a Bible just written on what he did during those 40 days after the resurrection. Do you know what it would have been like to be with the resurrected Jesus that probably glowed in the night? He, you know what I'm saying? You couldn't turn the light off because Jesus would just glow all the time. You know, so what a powerful thing to be with the resurrected Jesus. For 40 days, he walked among the face of the earth, was then ascended into heaven, told them to go to the upper room and wait on him, wait on, wait on the uh, Holy Spirit to come. Ten days later, the Holy Spirit arrives and comes. But I'd like to talk to you about uh, an event that happened just prior to that. But one of the things we need to realize is then that Pentecost Sunday because it is synonymous with the Holy Spirit falling upon the church, is really the birthday of the church. We are now in the midst of celebrating the birth of the church. 
The church was brought into existence. It was made. It was brought into a creation, and it was actually illuminated by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the birthday of the church of God. Amen, amen, amen. So here we are in the midst of God bringing about this great birthday. It represents the third of the Trinity. God was present, sent his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm leaving, but don't worry about it. I'm sending the Holy Spirit back. And the third person of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity is here with us. And as pastor said, we're wearing red to recognize that presence of his coming. Well, on this, <clears throat> on this particular day, when there was this particular move of God, it's before uh, this time when the Holy Spirit falls. But it's one of those discussions about what Jesus was doing during those 40 days. And during the 40 days he was here, 10 of the 12 disciples were with him. Not all of them were there. One disciple, of course, had fallen away and had actually gone on to kill himself because he had not followed with the will of God. I'm not preaching that sermon this morning. Don't worry about it. But there was another one, and I'm not going to preach that too much today either, but there was another disciple that wasn't there that day. I don't know why he wasn't there. Why would he miss a presence and a move of God? I don't know what was his absenteeism, but he missed Jesus showing up. Last thing that I want to be accountable for is that Jesus was going to have a move of God. Jesus was showing up, and I wasn't there. He wasn't there when Jesus moved. Well, I can tell you right now, you're right in the middle of God moving on this morning and having his way in this place. <laughs> Only 10 of the disciples were there. So what was the reason for the oncoming or the presence of the Holy Spirit being offered to everybody? First of all, it is so that we are, and people will begin to say that, so that we are anointed, so that we are empowered, so that we have spiritual, supernatural abilities. The Holy Spirit doesn't mean anything if you don't move to anointing, to empowerment, and supernatural abilities. Three things I'd like to share with you this morning that I believe come right out of this particular text. And uh, it comes from my title, The Cost of Pentecost. The Cost of Pentecost. The first one is deception. The second one is a liberation, and the third one is activation. Deception, liberation, and activation. Deception from 19 to 20, liberation from 21 to 22, and activation from 22 to 23. The cost of Pentecost. I always hear the, uh, the fathers in the gospel, the, the mothers in the gospel, the people who have really uh, uh, come through the prayer time and come through the move of God, they always tell you, it'll cost you something, baby. You know what I'm saying? When you sit there and talk to him, you say, how can I get anointed like you? How can I pray like you? How can I lay hands on people like you do? And how will people raise up? I want to, I want to be more than just a nominal Christian sitting in the rows. I want to have some power in my life. And then the saints would tell you, they say, baby, it comes with a cost. You've got to pay a cost to be anointed like that. I've got some bruises. I've got some marks. And they begin to open up their coat and show you where they've been wounded emotionally and what has happened to them. And they say, it costs me something. But I've got an anointing. You don't get to that place of being anointed without it costing you something. Are you willing to pay a price so that you can be in the place that God has called you to be at? Here it is. Here it is that I am preaching this morning on the cost of Pentecost. And the first thing that we must realize is that we have to deal with the fact of deception, verses 19 through 20. Allow me to go there with you for a moment. Tell the person next to you real softly. You don't want not too much air to be pushing their direction. Real softly say to the person next to you, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Because if you get deceived, you'll miss what God is doing. Don't be deceived. So now, what does this talk about? This begins to open up. Jesus has just been somewhere, and then he goes 
to, to uh, locate, or shall I say, to arrive where the disciples are. Whatever journey he was on, which I wish we had some scripture to tell us what he was doing, because you know he's walking around raising folk up from the dead, blessing people, giving folk food, whatever he was doing, because Jesus just did not go anywhere where he was not anointed. Hear me for a moment. Jesus' moments of anointing weren't just in prayer. It wasn't just when he was asked to come to the pulpit. It wasn't just when he was asked to read a scripture or teach a class. Jesus walked in an anointing. Every place he went, he was anointed. People, got, he touched folk. He was looking on an ongoing basis to make a difference in somebody's life. So when Jesus walked by, people literally came and touched him and ran up to him. And everybody was being blessed. Why? Because there was an anointing on his life. I refuse to be a Christian who walks around impotent with no power, no, no essence, nothing in my life. There's no difference between me and somebody else in the world. My God, somebody should be able to walk up and grab a hold of my hand and I should be able to intercede in the glory and the power of the Almighty. Somebody should tell me that they were about to commit suicide. Somebody should tell me that they weren't going to make it. Somebody should tell me that marriage was about to give up. But my God, when you walked by, when you came down the aisle. Why, why have I come this morning? I come this morning because I believe God's anointed me. And I believe I want to walk by you this morning. I believe there's an anointing on my life. I believe there's a Pentecost in my life. And I want to walk by you today because I know you need a touch from the master's hand. I just need to walk by. I just need to walk by you. There's an anointing on my life. And I respect the anointing in your life. Christians started saying to one another, somebody would say, you know what, uh, bless you. And they'd say, I'm already blessed. And somebody say, I'm going to pray for you. I'm already prayed for. What are you talking about? I know you have an anointing in your life. So when you say, bless me, there's an anointing you have. I want to receive your anointing. Bless me. I just received your anointing. I want people to give into my life to bless me because the power of the Holy Spirit is upon them. Unless you just want to be one of those nominal, no essence, no power, sit on the bench, Christians. Let, let me say this very shortly because I want to get right back into deception. When I first came on the football team and I got promoted to the, to the varsity team, I was sitting on the bench. I'd never sat on the bench before. And I was like, this isn't any fun. You watch everybody else play and you sit there. But listen, you're supposed to cheer everybody else on. You clap. You say, oh, yeah, good job. Well done. You see, some Christians have become cheerers from the bench. So, so, so what they do is they sit there and watch other people perform and do the work of God. And they go, oh, good job. Great, 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 good job. I was like, no, I can't do this any longer. The coach turned to me because somebody got hurt. And he turned to me and he said, look, Mike, he said, go out there. It's just for a play. He said, go out there for a play. I was a sophomore, so I should have been playing anyway. But they brought me up and he said, go out there and just cover this play till we get, the, get this linebacker together and get him back out there. I went out there. We were playing against Simeon. I still remember the day, the time, everything. We were playing against Simeon, and the guy came across the middle, and when I saw him, I saw him. I'm telling you, I hit him so hard, my toes, my feet hurt when I hit him. I was like, oh, that hurt so bad. And he took a minute to get up, but I knew one thing. I said, this is about to get me off that bench. Somebody help me. When you, start, when you start doing what God called you to do, it'll get you off the bench. And there's a lot more fun being in the game than there ever is when you're watching the game be played. But you got to get out of deception. Jesus taking a walk. He was anointed every place he went. He walked into a room where the disciples were in, and they all depressed. They sad. But Jesus is anointed. He's not worried about the depression or the sadness that's present. He walks in the room, the Bible says, the Bible says they were afraid. The Bible says fear had gripped the room. 
Now, one of the things I want you to understand is that fear is so deceptive that you don't know when you're afraid. Fear is so strange that the only time we really understand fear is when somebody steps out and say, boo. But there's a whole lot of stuff that you're afraid of. A lot of stuff that you don't challenge, that you don't step up to the table, that you don't take to the next level because fear has got you literally frozen from doing what God has called you to do. The Bible said on a Sunday evening, just like today, just like this evening today, it said they were all sitting in a room together. That means they had to communicate. They got on their social media. They sent each other a message, and they said, hey, let's get together. They Facebook each other. They all got together. And the Bible said on a Sunday evening, how are all of them sitting together on a Sunday evening except for Thomas? He wasn't there. He must have decided he wasn't going to come. The rest of them there, Judas had a bad ending, so he wasn't there. And the Bible says that they sit there on a Sunday evening afraid of the Jews, that they're going to come and take them. Now, the, the worst thing in the world, if you're already afraid and you hide now, is for Jesus just to walk through without opening the door up. You're like, oh! Jesus walks into the room. And so in the midst of the fear that they are encompassed with, this is what Jesus said. The Bible said Jesus came to them. He stood among them before he ever opened his mouth up. See, Jesus has what we must have in our life, an anointing. Jesus just walked in the room right then. They already, every eye is on him because he's anointed. And then he just stood among them. I don't think he said a word. He just stood there for a minute because there's anointing in his life. This time you got to show up at the hospital, you just stand there. Just stand there. You say, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. You don't have to. There's an anointing in your life. There's, there's time when your kids will walk in the house from doing crazy. Don't even open your mouth up. Don't even say anything. They are under conviction right now while they're staring at you. And you just stand there for a minute and they feel the conviction while they are there because there's an anointing. It is supernatural. It is not normal. It's not because of what you said. It's not because of what you did. It's because there's an anointing in your life. Your life must make a difference. It can't simply just be every day. It must bring people into accountability. I was talking to a friend of mine, and he was telling me about how mad his family was with him. He said, I hadn't done anything to them. I don't know why they are attacking me. I said, because you in and of yourself represent the anointing of God. And they can't take it when they're around you. Their skin starts crawling. They, they oh my God, there comes the anointed one. You pull something out of them just in your presence because evil cannot stand in the presence of the anointing of God without being challenged. I don't know about you, but you, you have to, I have to, you have to, at some time you have to get tired about wickedness and evilness being around you. And you have to declare that there's a power of God in you to make a difference. Listen, they were afraid of the Jews. Sometimes we're afraid of financial failure. Sometimes we're afraid of the loss of relationship kids, family, wife, and we're going to go into some area of destruction. That's what I'm telling you. Fear is so strange. It lives among us in a strange way. Some people are sp afraid, they're scared of spiritually backsliding. They know they're not in right relationship with God, and they're slipping away every day, and they're further and further away from God, and they have a fear about, am I going to get myself together? Am I going to get my act together? Am I going to be who God wants me to be? And they're living in fear that they're not right with God. Because let me tell you something, if you're not right with God, there's a fear that overtakes you. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. The further I get from God, the more afraid I feel. Because he's awesome. The closer I am to him, the more I feel in love and close to him. But there's a fear when you're too far away from God. You know, you got to reach over in the bed and check, see if your wife's there. Did, did, did the rapture happen? Because you're just living in fear. You know you're not right. You driving your car too fast and somebody pull out in front of you. You're like, oh, oh, because you can't die. You cannot die right now. I can't die right now. Mm-mm, mm-mm. I got to get a few words in. Lord, I repent. God, watch me, cleanse me. Make my heart pure. That's too many words when you got hit. That's too much. So somebody cut you off. You're like, oh, oh. Because you're not living right. Tell somebody next to you, don't live in deception. Don't live in deception. This is a real word. This is a real word. 
Jesus came and he, and, he, and he stood and he spoke to them. And this is what he said. He said to people who are living in this place of deception, people who are undergoing spiritual backsliding, people who are suffering from the loss of relationship. And he says to us today, with everything going on in your life, he says, peace be with you. I can just, if you can just see this for a moment, but Jesus walks in the middle of them afraid and scared. No matter what you're going through in your life, no matter what you're enduring, he walks in the middle of your situation, stands in the middle of your situation, and doesn't say a word. And when he has all of your attention on him, he looks at you in the eyes and he said, peace, peace be with you. Now, you can't say peace be with you unless you can give it. Now, I can say peace. I, need, I, I, I want peace on me, but I can't put peace on you unless I have something I can give away. The, the anointing of God allows you to possess the fruit of the Spirit and give it away to somebody else. I can give love to you. I can give kindness to you. I can give to you patience. I can give to you peace. I can give something to you when I have it in the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will affect your life. It doesn't just affect me. When you walk in the presence and the power of Pentecost, it affects the lives of the people around you. They cannot live normally while you are there because Pentecost is all over you. It's not something you do on a Sunday or on a Wednesday night. It's an everyday walk in him. Somebody give God a hand clap. Somebody give God some praise. Listen. I'm spending more time here than I wanted to, but let me say this to you. In the midst of everything going on, Jesus pauses after he says, peace be with you. This is a very contradictory thing. It wouldn't make sense except it's him. Then he pulls his sleeve out. He says, peace be unto you. Then he pulls his sleeve out and he shows them the holes in his hand. Then he takes his shirt, takes his robe. He's wearing a full robe. He had to pick that robe up. He wasn't worried about revealing. He wasn't trying to hide the wounds. He wasn't trying to cover himself up. He picked his robe up. I want you to see my wounds. I want you to see my hurt. I want you to see my pain. Pentecost cost something. How are you talking about going through with God and being everything God wants you to be? And then as soon as you hit something, you falling out. You can't take it. You can't go any further. Let me tell you something. I don't care what you're facing. I don't care what you're going through. Pentecost will cost you something. And if you pay the price, you'll be anointed in God. Somebody needs an anointing. Somebody needs the power of God. Somebody needs the glory of God in this place. Look, look, you're not operating where you should be operating. Somebody say, Pastor, come in here to preach some conviction on, on, yes, I did. You are not operating where you should be operating. You're not. You're not. And I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about what God called you to. I'm talking about maturity. At you, are you at the place God wanted you to be at? Because if you are, and you will be today, coming forth from you, Coming forth from you is the Holy Spirit, not you. The power of God. Jesus shows him the wounds that he has. And I believe what he's saying to them is this. I took on the worst. He said, y'all in here think you're going through? Y'all think you had a difficult time? The Jews, could you, no, Jesus didn't do this. Jesus didn't do this. This is what I would have done. The Jews are after you. Are you scared? That's what he said. He, Jesus didn't say that. Instead, what Jesus says to them, he says, look, y'all going, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying you ain't going through, but I want you to see something. I want you to see something. Have you been stabbed in the side yet? Has, you, has your hand been pierced? Have your feet been pierced yet? He says, look, I want to tell you something. Pentecost will cost you something. He's saying, get up from here and stop sitting in all this depression and stop worried about everything that's going on. I've called you out from among them and I've given you an anointing. Take on the world that is before you and do what God has called you to do. Hmm. 
he, he shows them he shows them his wounds. You know, let, let me tell you something. I think it's time to show some people our wounds. I really do. I think it's time to tell some people, people going through it. I think it's time to tell them, look, you know what? I am on my second marriage. And yeah, I had, I had some troubles. It didn't go the right way. These are shames I kept under my robe. I kept all these things under my robe. I didn't want nobody to know about them. But God said I would need to show my wounds to somebody because they need to understand the anointing of God will keep you and carry you to the other side. There's people who have been through some real trouble in their life. And they're enjoying the power of God now. But people don't know it because they keep their robe on. You got wounds. You got deep wounds. You got cuts. You got stuff that happened to you. Why must we pretend like we haven't been wounded, like we haven't been hurt, like we didn't go through something? Why can't we lift our robe up and help somebody out? And say, I need you to see where I was stabbed in the side. Because I, what he said to them was, I took it on and I'm here. You can take this on. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard, but you can win. Nobody here has died on a cross. Nobody here has been stabbed in the side. Nobody's been pierced in the hands. I took the devil on, went down to hell, made a show of him openly, and I am walking before you right now. Give God one more hand clap of praise for he deserves it. Jesus says it like this. Let me say it this way to you. He says, look at my offenses. He says, look where I've been offended. Have you been hurt? Have you been innocent, didn't do nothing, and somebody hurt you? Have they taken your money and didn't pay it back? Have they taken your friendship and your love and didn't return it? Have you been offended when you were right? Have you been offended for no reason? Has somebody just called you out, went there and gave your secrets away, told stuff about you behind your back, was supposed to be your running buddy, but they were one of the worst enemies you had? Have you been offended before? Have you been hurt in the church? Has somebody said something about you that you just were sitting back going, that couldn't happen, that can't happen in the ministry? And Jesus said, I've been offended. He said, but I paid the cost. Because there's an anointing. Don't be deceived. Fear is not a reason to serve God. Now, I can't sing. So I shouldn't sing. But you can sing. But you're sitting there afraid to sing. Because you're sitting there going, oh, it's got to sound perfect. It's got to be exactly right. And don't even realize it's going to be the anointing after it leaves me anyway. It's going to be the anointing. It's going to fall anyway. Why am I sitting there talking about how good I am when it's going to be God's anointing? Somebody's sitting there going, you know what? I, you know, I, 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 when I get in front of people, I begin to lock up. Well, it's time to start opening up and saying, God, God bless me while I'm free because I am ready to serve. I'm ready to do what God has called me to do. I must move to the place of liberation from deception. Don't be deceived. Be set free and use your wounds as advantages. And then there is liberation. The Holy Spirit, of all the names that he's called, one of the names he's called is Comforter. Because he comforts you while he, while he liberates you and sets you free. The Bible says that Jesus says the second time after he shows them their wounds, because it's kind of shocking when you see people's wounds. I was, watching the new, I was watching a TV show the other day, and the man that was standing there was a, was a hit man. And he said that after being a hitman, he said he's got his life together, doing the right things now. He said, but when I was a hitman, he picked his shirt up. I don't know if you all saw that. It was on Netflix or whatever. He pulled his shirt up. He was a hitman. He had been shot almost within a, a six-foot span. He was shot in the chest with a shotgun. And he said, look at my, he said, all of this mangled because of what I've gone through. And he said, but look, I'm alive and I'm here. You got some wounds, but you made it. You made it because God kept you. You made it because God walked with you. You made it because God carried you. You made it because you weren't walking. He was walking with you. Give him some glory and give him some praise because he kept you. Let me tell you, let me tell you when he kept you. He kept you when you weren't right. 
He kept you when you fell away. He kept you when you were in sin. He kept you when you weren't living and doing the things God called you to do. He kept you regardless of what you were doing because he is a good God. He deserves to get some praise and to get some worship because through your wounds, he kept you. My God. My God. I just want one more minute here because you know what you've been through. Oh, somebody, you know what you've been through. You would not have made it. You would not have got to the other side if it just would not have been because of him. God, you kept me. Somebody had a drug problem, and you weren't supposed to come out. You were supposed to be dead on the street someplace, and God kept you. (laughs) Somebody knew they sat in their living room and said they were about to kill themselves, and they didn't want to be here anymore, and this was over. But God had them put that thing down and said, you stay here. I've got a purpose, and I've got a reason for you. Don't you miss what God called you to do after you've been through all you've been through already. It's now time to do what God has mandated in your life because he kept you for a reason. Give him one more praise, just one more magnification. It's it's a shocking thing when you show somebody your wounds. They're going to get shocked. You know, hey, look, I was in a marriage. I tore it up. Tore it up. Just tore it up. And you start showing people your real mess up. Yeah, yeah, I was sexually abused. And and, and somebody repeatedly sexually abused me. When you do that, people are sitting back there. They don't know what to say. You get finished showing them your wounds. And this is what Jesus says. Because you get shocked. And Jesus said to them, he said, look. Peace be with you. He says it a second time. Because after you see the wounds that can happen in this world, he says to him again, he says, peace be with you. See, if I stop for a moment, just had a testimony time right now, somebody would pop up and say, do you know what my son went through? Do you know what it did to me? And they would step up and they'd jump in. And I would, what do you say to them? Peace be with you. Then somebody would jump up and they'd say, look, uh, they told me that I have cancer. I'm not going to get over it. They said I'm going to die in just a few days. I'm overcome by the pressure of what's going on in my life. You look at me, you say, peace be with you. And somebody said, say, I've lost all my money. And I didn't manage it right. And, and, and I, it's my fault. And I'm on the streets right now. And you say, look, I tell you, peace be with you. I'm not just saying that to make you feel good. I have an anointing in my life to speak Peace over you. This this is what Jesus told the disciples. He told them, he said, when you go to somebody's house and you go there to witness to them, he said, if they receive the gospel, when you go there, he said, speak peace over their home. Not because you're just speaking peace. It's because you're giving peace. And the Bible says that they became peace givers. But I want you to know you can't give something you don't have. Jesus was preparing the disciples to do ministry after he left. But they can't do the ministry he was doing, the peace ministry, until they get peace. When they have peace, they can be peace givers. And Jesus is establishing them right now as peace givers so that they can do ministry. Even though Jesus had a wound in his side, wound in his feet, a wound in his hand, when they looked at his face, they saw peace. Do you know what that does when you look at somebody that's wounded and you go, oh, my God, as wounded as you are, how are you sitting there like that? Do you know when you look at somebody who's going through somebody right here today, not somebody, some bodies, are going through some real stuff in their life. But however, when you look at them, it doesn't look like it. Somebody says, stop faking, stop making, stop just pretending. They're not pretending at all. It's because God spoke peace to them. In the midst of the trial, in the midst of the situation, God said, peace be with you. Peace be with you. You will not be overtaken by your circumstance, nor by your situation. Jesus says, you must have peace to give peace. He needed them to be peace people. That's why they had to get out of deception. They had to be people of peace before they could give peace. They couldn't minister peace. That's part of the anointing. Part of the anointing of Pentecost is to have people reconciled and have peace in their life. This is what Jesus says to them. He says, as the Father sent me. He said, just like the Father sent me. That's powerful. Jesus said, just like I'm sent. 
He says, I send you. Just like I'm sent, I send you like he sent me. Do you know what it's like to walk up to somebody and say to them, the same anointing, the same God who sent me, not another God, not somebody else, the same God who dug me out and placed me, he said, somebody sitting there admiring you, and you turn around and tell them, instead of saying, yeah, I am all that good, you turn around and say, no, the same God who raised me up, the same God who kept me, the same God who speaks through my mouth, the same God who used me, he said, the same God is going to send you to do what you're going to do. He is but one God with one mission and one purpose. Same God who sent me. This is what Jesus said to them. The same God who sent me is sending you all. Man, if I was in a room depressed, I'd be standing up by there. Because you know they had to be sitting down, depressed. And then he says to him, the same God who sent me is sending you. Now watch this. When they first came to Jesus, Jesus said, come and do what? Follow me. He's not asking them to follow him anymore. Don't follow me no more. I don't mean don't follow me. You know what I mean. They got a new mission now. Their first mission was to learn something. He said, but then after you learn something, don't sit there in the learning mode for the rest of your life. Do something with what you have learned. How you been in Christ for 10 years talking about you still learning? And so he says, come. He said, look, once you have learned something, then he says, look, go forth and I send you. And he said, as he was saying these words to them, same God who sent me sent you. The Bible says, as he was saying these words to them, he paused and he breathed on them. Almost in the same moment, he said, the same God who has sent me sends you. <laughs> <laughs> He looks at the disciples. He said, the same God on me, the same God who kept me, the same God who let me endure the wounds in my side and my feet. He said, the same God on me is on you. And he blew God on them. Oh, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the same power on me is on you. Let me pause for a theological moment. The scholars are somewhat uh, in conflict as to whether or not they actually received the Holy Spirit or received a forecast of the Holy Spirit because they were still in the upper room later. So some scholars said that they did receive the Holy Spirit early. Others say that, no, this was just a forecast of them receiving the Holy Spirit and it was going to fall later on the day of Pentecost. Now, for me, it doesn't really matter. Let me tell you why. Because if God is foretelling me about what he's going to do, I'm as excited as the day he's going to do it. <laughs> If God is telling me, I'm about to bless you, I'm about to carve you out, I'm about to use you for my glory, I got my hand on your life. Look, I don't need it to happen right then because God said it, and I'm already giving God the glory and giving God the praise. I speak peace over your life right now. I speak the glory of God over your life right now. I speak God's advantages and God's change over your life right now. I have an anointing. I speak that anointing over you. Glory be to God. He said, I send you a very well-known person, somebody who has made themselves very effective in the ministry. Dr. Ramirez, who's my boss, this is what he said to me, and it's a very famous statement of his. He said, Pentecost is not a ticket to heaven. It's the empowerment to go to the world. He said, if you think you got Pentecost to show everybody that you're spiritual and you're godly, he said, Pentecost is no ticket to heaven. Pentecost came so you'd have an empowerment to go and make a difference in the world. Man, I've got power so that I can affect the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil. I'm about to do God's work. That's why I'm blessed. He said this and he breathed on them. Let me pause for the, for the activation, 22 through 23. It says when he breathed on them, he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive ye, are in the black church, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Because I still think he needs to be mystical. I think he needs to be different. I think he needs to be unique. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive something you don't know nothing about. Sometimes we make the spirit like, oh, that's the spirit. But everybody got a decent respect for ghosts. 
Somebody said there's a ghost in here. Everybody, oh! But the spirit's here, yeah, because people tell you all the time, I'm sending my spirit with you. No, keep it, keep it. Don't send your spirit with me. Mm -mm. People said, I'll be there in the spirit. No, don't be there in the spirit. You and your spirit stay together, okay? Don't send spirits around. I don't need any other spirits floating around here. Oh, I'll be at your house in spirit. Nope, nope, keep your spirit. Keep it with you. People do all kinds of things with spirits, but you start talking about the Holy Ghost. Folk ain't talking about I'm sending my ghost. No. They still got to all. They still got to respect work with me for a moment. I'm only using some, I'm using some, some language. That's all I'm doing. But listen, he tells them, receive ye. There, there doesn't seem to be anything in this that's suggestive. Nothing is here that seems to be some kind of discussion. He says to them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. He doesn't tarry with them. He doesn't work with them. He doesn't fight with them. He says, receive the Holy Ghost. You need, you know what you're about to go through. You need the Holy Spirit. You need to be empowered by God. Because I got some people coming in your life tomorrow that will either tax you or you'll deliver them. Oh, watch me for a moment. There's some people in your life because they're not getting delivered, they're taxing you. They've come because they're broken. They come because they're tore up. And you're sitting there going through with them when you don't realize they were sent to you to deliver them. Since they're not delivered, they're taking all your energy away. But if you operated in your anointing, you would go ahead and hit the sea and pray for them to be set free by the glory of God. Come on, you've got to give God some glory because God's about to help you right now. This is what he says to Peter. He says, look, receive the Holy Spirit because he wants to turn them into him to do ministry just like he did. He says, as the Father sent me, I send you. He says, go out and do ministry just like I did. And he says to them, he says, look, he says, I need you to do ministry. The Bible said the next time that Jesus comes encounter with them, they've gone back to doing what they were doing before. The Bible said they're out there fishing, doing whatever. I could, that's a whole sermon, so I'm not going to. Gone fishing, but you know. But the Bible says that when 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 God when Jesus has an encounter with Peter, this is the encounter he has with Peter. He says to him, He says, Peter, do you love me? He should have said, If you love me, then hold me tighter. If you love me, admire me more. If you love me, worship me with everything in you. He doesn't say any of that. Let me tell you what he says to him. He says, Peter, if you love me. Feed my sheep. He says, if you love me, there's an anointing on your life. If you love me, you'll move out in your anointing and you'll make a difference in this world. You are not meant to be here to simply love God. You're not meant to be here to simply give God worship. You're not here just so you and God can have a cozy little time in the corner. You're here because there's an anointing from God in your life to make a difference in somebody else's life. You not only have a vertical, but you got a horse horizontal relationship. I need to get set free. I need you in my life. You have an anointing to set me free. Let me say this just for one minute. The anointing in your life is not in my life. So I don't care how anointed the person you're talking to, they don't have your anointing. So your ministry is needed because your anointing is unique to you. And when you sit on your anointing, you sit on my deliverance. When you won't step out, you cause me to be bound. When you are locked up, I'm in captivity. When you won't move, I can't move. But my God, when the Holy Spirit stirs up on the inside of you and you come over to me and you give me a word from the Lord and set me free, I can't stay bound up like this any longer. Somebody on the back row over in the corner needs me. And I'm standing here tied up. I feel like Lazarus. If I got to get up and start hopping, I've got to go somewhere. Because there's an anointing in my life. I might have been dead, but now I'm alive. Listen. This is what he says to them. If you forgive, it's forgiven. 
If you withhold, it is withheld. It's another one of those difficult, hard scriptures. Because the Bible says only God can forgive. Jesus he is called on the carpet because he tells somebody, your sins are forgiven. They say, oh, no, you can't say that. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus goes, duh, I'm God. That's what I've been trying to tell you all since I've been here. I'm God. So how are we going to run around and say, your sins are forgiven unless we become God? So did he say you're God? Because in scripture, sure, this is Jesus talking. Jesus says if, you, if, he says, if you forgive them, they are forgiven. He says, look, if they, were, if they, if they stay in there, and they, he says, then if they are withdrawn, then they withdraw. They're not forgiven. What power was he talking about? Let me tell you what power he was talking about so that you don't get confused. The people will walk around and say, thou forgiven. Who, who, set free. They'll walk over to somebody else and say, you're not forgiven. Straight to hell. Shoom, gone. Gone. Because you know some people around here do send people to hell. They do. They do. You have, no, you have no power. You have no power. You have no power. You have no power to send anybody to hell. You don't. You don't. You don't have any power to send somebody to hell. No more than you have power to send somebody to heaven. You can't. You know what people talking about? Go to go to where? You can't go nobody somewhere. I don't know why people, if, if it's so popular, why don't you tell people, go to heaven, go to heaven. Get mad at folks. Go to heaven then. Go to heaven. You that man, send him to heaven. Go to heaven. Go to heaven. No. No, because you know you can't send him to heaven. But guess what? You can't send him there either. You have no such power. So what power was Jesus talking about right here? This is the power he was talking about. He was telling them that as they preach the gospel and do the work of God, that as people are forgiven, they are forgiven as you present the gospel. Declare unto them what God has done in their life. For those people who hold on to their sin, declare unto them, if you hold your sin, you're not going to make it. Declare what God has already spoken while you walk around. Now, now, let me tell you how powerful this is. We are not people who give declarations that, that supersede God. We are people of confirmation and not declaration. You cannot make God do nothing. But I'm telling you what you're doing, what God has already done, what God has already spoken what God has already said, where God is already moving, if you will speak just what God is saying, you confirm what the Lord is doing. Let, let me tell you how pregnant that is. God has word all over this sanctuary right now for everybody in here. There's words for everybody that's stored up in heaven. God is constantly speaking to people, but they may not be receiving it. You don't need to declare something new out your own head. All you need to do is reach up into the heavenlies. Grab a hold of what God is already saying. And say, I declare unto you what the Lord has said unto you. Be thou blessed. Let thou be able to overcome this world in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. Please stand on your feet. Please stand on your feet. Pentecost is going to cost you something. But when you come in the face of God, you can't run in God's face and be filthy. You can't. Let me hear, hear me for a moment. You can't just decide, you know what, I'm just going to run to God and ask God for anointing. No, when you run to God, you got to get clean. First thing's got to happen is you got to get clean. You got to give up your deception. Tell God to cleanse you and make you right. See, the old Pentecostal church, they had it right. They used to say, in the old Pentecostal church, they used to say, look, you got saved, then you got sanctification, and then you got the Holy Ghost. So listen, when you said you want the Holy Ghost, the sisters would get you and pull you on the front row. And, and you'd be on the front row. God, let it loose. Hold on to it. Let it loose. Hold on. Let it go. And they would work you until everything ungodly 
They say, now nah, now nah, you ready. Ah, oh, now nah, you ready. Now nah, you ready. But, because you had to get sanctified. Now listen, I don't know if it happens exactly like that, but listen to me for a moment. When you come in the presence of God, he demands sanctification. He demands you to be right with him. And listen, even when you think you're right, when you get in God's presence and you see the face of Jesus, you know what's broken. I'm not what I should be. I need to do better. And I need some deliverance. And when I can admit that I need God like that, he can touch me and begin to heal the brokenness in me and say, peace, Michael, be with you. Then he can put an anointing in my life because when I have peace, I can give you peace. God's given you the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that you might have peace with him. The power of the Holy Spirit is to bring God's holy presence into unholy situations. Let me say it another way. God wants to go to your unholy. The most holy God in the world wants to take his holiness and go to your unholy, your most unholy place in your life. When you hide under your robe, your most unholy place, you don't let God expose your brokenness so you can get healed. God wants to go to that unholy place. Would you with me just for a moment? Just lift your hands. It won't be long. Because I think there's a time when we just say, God, I just need your holiness. I need the holiness of God. I feel like the holiness of God is here. The sanctification of God is in this place. There's a reason why you haven't reached the things that you should have reached, accomplished the things that God has called you to accomplish. It's because.